Having a little bit more time on my hands just recently has meant that I can have a really good look at my wardrobe and go through and recreate some things. I noticed that my tunic from last year was getting a bit worn out so I decided to make a new one. And I've really tried to break the video down into some very easy to follow step by step guides. Let's take a look. Alrighty, so medieval style tunic. There's actually been a bunch of finds of these things, uh, but few and far between, and they're not consistent. So you'll notice that there is a difference in uh, particularly the sleeve style, uh, and it's difficult to know for certain as to exactly what the influences were around some of these differences. Um, but I think that you can find, if you look at the evidence, that particular um, tunics were related to particular time periods. And so there is a difference, as I say, between uh, cultural differences and religious influences and some of these kind of things which come into the design of the tunic. However, also we're looking at the availability of materials and those kind of things. So there's a bunch of different things we need to look at um, before we go ahead and make our tunic. Now number one, we've got to decide about um, if we are reenacting uh, which culture are we looking at? For instance, are we looking at Anglo-Saxons? Are we looking at Vikings or Normans? Those kind of things. Because as I say, there are differences. Where are we in terms of social status? That's actually a really, really important one. And we'll come back to that in a few seconds time. Um, time period, as I mentioned, actually has some big influences around it. Alrighty. So these particular clues should give us some really good ideas about what our tunic is going to look like. The typical pattern for a medieval style tunic, and now this is particularly based on a Norwegian bog find that relates to around about the early 10 hundreds. Um, I, I can't remember the exact details, I'll try and find them and leave them in the description below. Okay, so let's talk pattern. The pattern usually consists of six pieces. The first is a large rectangle piece. And this is the torso, the front and the rear of our tunic. Okay, single piece, so it is folded in the middle and there is a head hole. Now the head shape will vary and obviously I'm not drawing this to scale. The next piece is going to be the sleeve piece. And these typically look like so. Uh, forgive my drawing, I'm, I'm not an expert here. All right. Now, um, so we have sleeve times two, we have a gusset times two, and then we have what are called gores, and we need two of those as well. Radio, right, yeah, that's our pattern. Now, let's think about how this relates to you. I'm going to put my measurements on. What your measurements are are obviously going to be different, and that's okay. To start with, um, this measurement here, 
through to here is your shoulder through to your uh, the, the length of the garment and that is for males typically around the knee or just below for ladies whose dresses were usually an almost identical pattern um, with, with some significant differences would usually be uh, down to the ankle or the floor length. In my case I'm going down to the knee so that is 115 centimeters plus seam. So total is 230. We'll talk seams in a second. My chest measurement is 75. I normally add around about 10 centimeters. Now that means that I have a little bit of extra room. You don't want it skin tight. Um, so I like to have an, uh, a little bit of extra room to provide room for movement around. I do a lot of weapons training and that kind of thing. And then I also allow a seam allowance. Radio. The gussets I cut at 14 centimeters square and you fold that in the middle and it then becomes a rhombus. We'll talk about that as we get to it. Radio. Your sleeve. This goes from the shoulder down to usually just below the armpit. Now I would compare that to one of your existing garments as to see how that works. So for me that's 28 centimeters times 2 is 52 correction 56 total. This measurement here is going to be the sleeve sort of the wrist measurement. Now this is not the your wrist Okay, everyone, or I say everyone, lots of people make this mistake and they just measure the, their own wrist and all of a sudden they can't get their hand in the hole. The reason being is your fist measurement is significantly bigger by around about five centimeters. So bear that in mind. The measurement you want to take is around your fist. Okay, all right. In my case, that's 14 times two, which is 28 centimeters. The sleeve length is from your shoulder to your wrist, in my case, 60. All right, going pretty well. Radio gauze. Typically for a guy, it's around about 50 centimeters or so. It depends on um, your body measurements. So that goes from your pelvis bone down to where, however long you want the garment to be. Uh, so I like to keep my tunics around about sort of knee or just below knee length. That's good for me. Radio and a width of, in my case, 30 centimeters. So this is, um, these are the gauze. They go on the side. They probably go from about here to, to here. And it allows a lot more flexibility. All right. Now, some points to note. Most people in the medieval period rode horses. That was their daily means of transport. And guys typically had a split under front and the rear of their tunics. Now some tunics had them, some didn't. What does that mean? We don't know because there's not enough of these tunics to really make that conclusive um, determination. Alrighty, I think that's pretty much everything we need to know except seams. I allow, I'll do this in red just so you can understand, I increase the size of my final measurements by two centimeters radio right on so that is two centimeters over here two over here two over here two over here um, and that gives me plenty of seam allowance for americans i'm not quite sure what that is in um in imperial measurements but but two centimeters 20 millimeters it's about um three quarters, roughly speaking, of an inch. Typically speaking, for the medieval period, the fabric choice was either wool or linen. Linen, in fact, really was, was the choice of fabric for everything next to skin. Uh, wool tends to be a bit itchy, um, but there we go. All right, if you think of uh, four layers of society, radio, here we go. Alrighty, yo. Now we have, um, if this is the lower echelons of society, so 
people from um, just the lower working class, I guess, tended to have colors which were beige, browns, um, yellows. In the lower sort of middle class ranges would be yellows to maybe some greens. You'd have a wider range of um, yellows to greens, including orange for your upper middle class and then royalty, uh, upper clergy, upper uh, echelons of society, the upper nobility, those kind of people may have access to red and purple. Righty, oh, now some people question purple in parts of the medieval period. Uh, that can be achieved through shellfish. Uh, red, orange, yellow can all be achieved through things like uh, marigold and greens from plants such as madder, I think. Browns from things like walnut and blues, which would come into your upper echelons uh, and upper sort of middle class, would come from a plant called woad. For large scale dyeing, or to at least get consistent dyes, you may need to actually have cultivated the, the woad plant uh, and that kind of thing. Now, royalty, nobility, those kind of people may also have trims in silk and that kind of thing. Uh, just a quick note here for anyone who's involved in medieval reenactment, your group will have some kind of authenticity guide. So have a look at that before um, going out and, and buying sort of expensive cloth and uh, finding you've produced something that your particular medieval group may not like. Everything is now marked out, now it's time to get cutting. I've simply used a kid's crayon as a marker. It's quite useful because they wash out really easily. First thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to sew the two sides of the torso together. I'm just going to use a very simple running back stitch. I keep my stitch length to around about six millimeters. Uh, just depends on the exact point of the, the sewing project. But six millimeters is about historically accurate and a nice running back stitch gives you plenty of strength to the seam. Remember I've got a seam allowance of two centimeters so that's plenty of room and then what will happen is I'll trim down one of those sides and fill the seams a little bit later on in the project. At the start of your stitch I like to go through maybe two or three times just to add that little bit of extra strength. Remember this is a functional garment, I do a lot of weapon training and so on so I like to make sure that my seams are going to hold. The last thing I want is something blowing out. Um, and then we're sewing it around about a six millimeter stitch length. It's quite interesting, um, the Victorians got their stitch length is to an incredibly small number. So it's sewing with a stitch length of like one and a half millimeters sometimes. It's pretty crazy. Alrighty. Now we're not sewing up too far here because I've got the um, sleeves to add in. This is a really good way of doing it as well because it just helps to make sure that all your seams are on the same side. Very, very easy sometimes to accidentally do a seam on the wrong side of the fabric and then when you go through you think, oh my goodness, I've gone and made a mistake. 
Um, so a nice running back stitch is pretty easy to undo if you have to and doesn't take too long to do. Um, so I'm also marking off exactly where on the on the garment that I want my seams to end. And as I say, just two or three stitches and that'll just a quick knot just to finish that. There we go. Alrighty, so far so good. Head holes good. The length is really good. I've got a really good fit. I can move around, no real restrictions. I'm really happy with this. Let's just take a little bit more of a look. All right, pretty happy with that. Really good length, really happy with this. Now what I want to do is add in the side gores. So exactly the same as before, just utilizing my nice seam allowance. Whoops. And just continuing on with the running back stitch. Now I'm going to put a contrasting uh, trim onto the bottom hem and also the cuffs and the neckline. We'll talk about that a little bit later. What I'm interested in right now is just getting this running back stitch done. Oops, there we go. Both of the gussets are now on. Now we're going to have a look at the sleeves. The first thing we're going to sew is we're going to sew the uh, gussets onto the sleeves. Here's my sleeve and here's my gusset piece. Okay. Now remember the gussets are sewn in a square and we want to turn that into a rhombus shape. So I've placed I'm placing my gusset straight along the seam exactly where I want that to sit. Now I'm just going to do a running stitch to secure that in place. Alright, so I want to start approximately a centimetre or so and I'm just going to use actually a running back stitch. And I'm keeping my stitch length to around about And you may be able to see that. I kind of hope you can. Um, Alright, I'm keeping my stitch length through around about four to six millimeters. Um, now I'm not the world's leading expert on hand sewing. What we're going to do after we have sewn this into place is we are going to fell the seams. Now I know for some people that sounds a bit complicated. It's actually really not. And it, it is a little time consuming, but that's okay. What I'd suggest you do while you're doing something like this is, is put on a good movie or have a couple of nice drinks. Um, it does take a little while, but it's really not that big a deal. And there's a lot of, uh, I think it's a lot of really pride really when, when you've actually made something like this by hand, especially. Make sure you use good choice of fabrics. Now for those of you who are in reenactment groups, your group should have an authenticity guide. And before you go out buying lots of expensive stuff or investing into a lot of gear um, really make the effort to check can I use this stuff a lot of reenactors myself included um, have bought stuff over the years and found it's it's not allowed or it's not period correct or whatever and that can be really quite frustrating um, when you consider how much some stuff costs. I'm quite lucky I've managed to sell most of the stuff that I, I realized I can't use and it is much better in my opinion to um, really put the effort in and and make yourself some good gear 
and it should last. It really, really should. I'm in and out of my costumes like every day, but I still find I can get a few good years out of them. And for those of you who might be wondering, I'm using these needles, uh, brass needles from a shop called Make Your Own Medieval. Um, these guys uh, have a really good array of very uh, historically accurate stuff and they make the effort to um, let you know on their website as to um, what period specific pieces are from Radio. Okay, now I just finish off with a simple knot. Um, I'm, as I say, going to fell the seams anyway so it really doesn't make too much difference. Radio, so this is the gusset that we just put on. And now what we're going to do, as you can see, it's the square. But we're going to sew it a mirror image of the other one. So it becomes like so. To help you avoid any holes or mistakes like that, um, make sure you basically go over your last stitch. And that should uh, prevent any holes or whatever. Now, I do a running back stitch on all of my seams first. So what that means is I should have a pretty good idea um, of any mistakes that have been made before I fell my seams. Now, for those of you who are new to sewing and who can afford it, it's worth making a mock-up first. What that means is you just get some cheap fabric, doesn't matter what the fabric is, just get some cheap fabric and just put together something um, to test out your pattern, to make sure your pattern is suitable for you. Have you got the sizes right? Have you taken into account all your seams? Have you... Um, and it gives you a chance to learn how to position your seams and to get some of your sewing techniques right. Um, before you go ahead and um, splurge a lot of money on good quality fabric. I'm sure a lot of you have noticed that fabrics are actually getting more expensive at the moment. And just leave a comment below. Have fabrics got more expensive where you are? I'm interested. Certainly for me, where I am in Australia, um, our two main suppliers of fabrics, which are Lincraft and Spotlight, um, have both increased their prices fairly significantly um, over the last couple of months. And a lot of the projects that I was doing, um, I've had to kind of prioritize, I guess. So, um, because I've been a bit disappointed about, yeah, how expensive some of this stuff has got. Alrighty, so that's uh, what our sleeve is now going to look like. All the, the seams there have been sewn in with a running back stitch. Now let's take a look at what this looks like. Now, let, now let's uh, give it a try on, make sure we've got everything right. Alrighty, there we go. Sleeve's looking pretty good. Nice sleeve length. That's come up to exactly where I want it. Very happy with that. The, um, there should be plenty of flexibility there for the arm to move. So there should be no restriction when I'm doing any kind of weapons training or whatever. So really happy with that. Let's crack on. Before you go about attaching your sleeves, just consider how much fabric you may want to trim down. So in my case, there's a little bit of fabric which probably goes up to about here, where I could trim that off. So I'm just going to mark that on, and that can just get, get removed. If I just check that against my sleeve, and you can see there's absolutely heaps of overlap there, so nothing wrong with trimming off a little bit of the excess, just to make sure your garment is nice and tidy. Alrighty, all of the major components are now assembled. I've got really good flexibility, I've got really good movement, nothing's restricted, I'm really happy with this. This has come out exactly as I'm looking for. Now what I'm going to do is fell all the seams. 
to explain what I mean, we need to go just over here. And we have a two centimeter seam allowance here, right? What we're going to do, there's a whole different range of ways we could essentially finish this seam. Now, one option would be to leave it as it is and it will eventually deteriorate over time. Another option is you could put a zigzag stitch through there if you're using a sewing machine and that would be okay. I'm not using a sewing machine, I'm trying to uh, hand sew everything. So what I'm going to do is fell the seams. So what that means is we're going to essentially iron, we iron the, the seam flat. Then you grab a pair of scissors and cut one of the seams right down. You're going to need pretty good uh, scissors. And just be very, very, very careful that you now don't go and cut through the outer fabric. But we want to cut that down to about a third. Alright, so how do we fell the seam? Okay, now we've ironed everything flat. What we do is we place the seam that we just cut on top of the other one. Rightio, now you should be able to see some contrast there. Now we fold those two over, right? And over once again. And now we're going to do what they call a catch stitch. This is, you want to keep your stitch length fairly short and just basically pick up the two, okay? All right, like so. Now, as I say, I'm using a catch stitch. This is historically accurate. However, you may be using a sewing machine, that's okay. It's really going to be down to whatever works for you and what you're looking to achieve. You want to keep the stitch length fairly small, but you also want to try to um, have a, a really strong seam. And that's what we're going for here. And if you're using the same color thread as your outer fabric, you really, it really should be a pretty invisible seam stitch. We'll talk about this a little bit more, kind of in a, another video. <coughs> but, there we go. Alright, now I'm going to go around all of my seams. So far this tunic has taken me about four hours. That includes the amount of time to cut. So really happy with that. This should be something that you could achieve within a day, if that was what you were hoping to achieve. Just depends on how much time you want to dedicate or whether you want to do it in blocks or whether you want to do it in, you know, how you want to, you want to achieve that. All right, the tunic is now all but finished. All the seams are filled, everything's been put into place. It's come out absolutely fantastic. But there's one detail that I still need to do and that is the cuffs and the neckline. What I've chosen to do is use some contrasting fabric to sew that on. You could simply roll, this, roll the, uh, the, the edges and that would be absolutely fine and a lot of people do that. But for me, I want to uh, just increase my, I guess, <laughs> um, the sort of status, if you like, of my character and therefore I'm going to add a little bit of contrasting colour. I've chosen to use red uh, because I think that night stands out and that's it's fairly consistent with the uh, the other items that I've made. Alrighty guys, this has come out so fantastic, so well, and I'm really, really super happy with it. Um, I've got so much movement in the arms. This is really excellent. Uh, it's, it's come out really well. The seams have come out really well. You can't really see the stitching too much. Um, so I think all in all, this is a really fantastic garment. This is a great little project to do. Um, and I really hope you've enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.